Okay. Thank you so much, Shika, for inviting me to talk to this group. I'm really excited to. Uh, so the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is space times with torsion. Uh, and a lot of this research came comes from my dissertation work at the University of California, Irvine. A lot of it was also in collaboration with Jim Weatherall there. So I'll sort of indicate at what points um, it's a kind of collaborative project. And then um, other points will be more solo work. Okay. So to set the scene, the guiding question of this research is how we should understand gravitational influence. So I'm gonna go through some well-known theories that I'm sure everybody here knows uh, lots about, but I'll, it'll sort of set the groundwork for what is to come. Okay, so the first such theory is Newtonian gravity. And Newtonian gravity, of course, tells us that gravitational influence is force-like. So if you have two bodies, they're exerting these attractive gravitational forces upon one another. Uh, in Newtonian gravity, we also have a background space-time that is flat. Uh, what this means is that we can think about these slices of flat space, time, uh, flat space that get stacked up through time. Uh, and so you can see that in the schematic. Okay, so we'll contrast this with the picture that general relativity paints. So in general relativity, we have a background space-time that is curved, and so we have objects with mass deforming this uh, background space-time and having this curvature. The speed of light is bounded in general relativity, so it's a relativistic theory, and the speed of light gets bounded by the edges of the light cones. So light travels along the edges of these cones, uh, and it's uh, uh, bounded, unlike in a classical theory. Okay, great. So a little bit more formally, in Newtonian gravity, the acceleration of bodies are, is determined by the gravitational potential, and this potential itself is determined by the mass density in the space-time. In general relativity, what we have is that bo uh, bodies will follow geodesics of the derivative operator. So if I want to tell you what a model of each of these theories is, I would have to specify different things. So if for a model of Newtonian gravity, I would give you the manifold. I have to give you two metrics, the temporal and spatial metric, the flat derivative operator, the gravitational potential, and the mass density distribution. For a model of general relativity, all I have to tell you is the background manifold, the single uh, metric, and the metric, the unique metric compatible derivative operator, the Levitch Vita derivative operator. Now, if you'll notice, uh, I've left some space in between these theories uh, on the slide. And so a theory that we can think of as kind of conceptually in between them is known as newton Cretan gravity. In newton cartons gravity, we have uh, the background space-time is spatially flat, uh, but it has some curvature. Uh, and so we think of it as a curvature in the temporal direction. So if we want to situate it in between, we have bodies following geodesics of the derivative operator, and these geodesics determ are determined by the mass density in the space-time. Uh, okay, great. So if I want to tell you a model of newton cartan gravity, what I'll have to give you is the uh, manifold. Still, because it's a classical theory, the two metrics, the spatial and temporal metric, now the curve derivative operator, uh, and the density distribution. Okay. So now I will present to you two facts that are also well known. So models of Newtonian gravity and newton cartan theory are systematically related. This is given by the Troutman geometrization and recovery theorem. Uh, the second fact is that you can recover models of newton cartan gravity in the classical limit of general relativity. Um, this has been shown, for example, by David Melamond, uh, and he give, goes through how one can start with a model of general relativity and uh, um, uh, apply some constraints uh, and along the way have models of general relativity as you allow the speed of light to go to infinity. If you do that, the theory that you end up with is newton cartan theory. Okay, so these are the two facts on the table. I'll now throw a wrench into this. So there is a relativistic theory of gravity that locally will make all the same predictions as general relativity, but is set on a flat space-time background and represents gravitational influence through forces. 
So this is kind of strange. We have an empirically equivalent theory. It's sat on a flat space-time background, though, and it uses forces, which are akin to a classical theory, like a Newtonian theory of gravity, but it's relativistic. This theory of gravity is known as teleparallel gravity. So gravitational influence here is force-like, but the forces are given by torsion. So there's a few different ways that you can think about torsion or how to visually represent it. One way is if you take two end-to-end -end factors, you parallel transport one on the other and the other on the one, you end up with broken parallelograms. So your parallelograms break in spaces with torsion. That's one way you can think about it. Another way to think about it is a measure of how the basis for a tangent space will twist as you parallel transport it along a curve. Either way, um, teleparallel gravity will have this torsion um, as part of the theory. Okay, uh, the background space-time and teleparallel gravity is flat, but again, it's a relativistic theory, meaning that is going to put bounds on the speed of flight. Okay, so let me go into a little bit more detail. The tetrad field here is what gives us a orthonormal basis for each point in the background space time for teleparallel gravity. And what we're going to do is replace the Levy Trivita connection of general relativity, because of course that's a torsion free connection, with a torsional one. And this will be called the Weizenbach connection, which will be formulated in terms of the tetrads. Um, in teleparallel gravity, bodies don't follow geodesics of the Weizenbach connection, and this is what gets you this force-like motion. Instead, the acceleration of bodies are determined by this velocity-dependent force, and the strength of that force is given by the space-time contortion. And the contortion is just a, a combination of different torsion terms. So, uh, it's basically just a, a way of representing the torsion. Okay, and the final thing I want to note is that it's empirically equivalent to general relativity, and in fact, in the physical literature, it has often been called the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity. So let me say a little bit more about the empirical equivalence here that we're talking about. Um, so in this, in what is, I think, the only book actually about teleparallel gravity, uh, Aldrovati and Pereira's teleparallel, teleparallel gravity. They say the teleparallel description of the gravitational interaction is completely equivalent to the description of general relativity. Um, and uh, in Eleanor Knox's treatment of the theory, she puts it as teleparallel gravity has been engineered to be empirically equivalent to GR. It's not just an accident. It's been engineered to recover the same empirical consequences. So she says the, the TPT, TPG Lagrangian turns out to be identical up to divergence to the einstein hilbert Lagrangian of standard general relativity. Um, and again, this is deliberate. In uh, the book, they go through how to recover some common space times uh, in the teleparallel framework. So they do Desitter and uh, Care as well. Now, um, some caveats though. So we're talking about local empirical equivalence. Uh, so certain topologies might not admit a global tetrad field. And so you might think, well, they, they're not sort of, kind of globally equivalent. They might not admit the same models that's fine. We're talking about local empirical equivalence. And you might also have worries about this um, up to the divergence term or these sorts of boundary condition kinds of worries. If you're interested in that, um, James Reed and Willow Wolf have a paper um, on the role of boundary conditions and empirical equivalence here. Okay, so with those caveats, we can um, let us assume going forward that these two theories are empirically equivalent. Okay. So you might wonder now, why would you care about teleparallel gravity in the first place, especially as a philosopher? So there are two main reasons I'd like to give. So the first is questions about underdetermination. And this is uh, presented in Eleanor Knox's paper that I mentioned earlier. So there she's looking at whether there is underdetermination between uh, general relativity and teleparallel gravity. Uh, and she goes through a series of arguments, ends up arguing that, in fact, these are not so distinct theories that we should have any worries about undetermination. But the question remains uh, and can be analyzed further whether there would be any undetermination between them. 
So that's one reason you might care. Another reason you might care is about uh, conventionality of geometry. So if we have these two empirically equivalent theories, there is a question about conventionality as to whether it's curvature or torsion that better represents um, the effects of gravity. Okay, so I've set the scene, I've presented all these theories. Now I'm gonna give you what the guiding questions of uh, the, the next, say like 45 minutes are gonna be. Uh, the two questions that I have uh, going forward, the first is, is there an analog to this torsional theory is, uh, in the classical case? So we know that teleparallel gravity is the torsional equivalent of general relativity, but is there a way of introducing torsion into a classical theory of gravity? And the reason I'm interested in this question is because I want to know whether or not you can take the classical limit of teleparallel gravity, and in that classical limit, whether or not you can maintain torsion. So the idea is, can you uh, first formulate a torsional classical theory of gravity? And if the answer to that is yes, then you might wonder, is it possible to recover that theory in the classical limit? So these are the two parts of the talk. The first is going to be showing, yes, you can formulate a classical theory of gravity with torsion. And the second is going to show that, in fact, that theory will not be the classical limit of teleparallel gravity. So I have to go through each of these in turn. Let's start with the first, uh, a classical space-time with torsion. Okay. So the first thing that we want to, to do when we are constructing a classical space-time with torsion is figure out what the components of the space-time ought to be. Like, what kinds of things do we expect such a theory to do? Uh, because it's a classical theory, we expect that our notion, uh, that we should have a notion of absolute time. In other words, we should want to be able to take the absolute temporal distance between events, just like you would do in, say, Newtonian gravity or newton Cartan theory. We want this uh, temporal metric to be closed. Another thing we want is a derivative operator with non-vanishing space-time torsion, of course, because we're looking for a torsional theory, and we want it to be compatible with the classical metrics, the temporal and the spatial metric. And then there's another question about what kind of force equation we want or what kind of field equation we want this theory to uh, obey. And here we actually have a ton of flexibility. And so what I'm going to propose is that we look to standard Newtonian gravity and look at how it works there and take inspiration from that. Okay, so how does it work there? Well, we have a gravitational potential that is going to generate forces. So on the left-hand side of this equation, you see the acceleration field felt um, the acceleration field. And on the right, you see the gravitational uh, force felt by the particle. Uh, and we also expect that Poisson's equation will be satisfied. So the second derivative uh, of that gravitational potential is equal to four pi rho, where rho is the Newtonian mass density function. If we want to adapt this to the torsional context, what we want to do is introduce some kinds of torsion terms into the forces felt by particles. So the gravitational force felt by the particle, we should have some kind of torsional component to it. When we're thinking about how to introduce this torsional component, you may recall that um, a lot of this goes through uh, the relation of connecting fields. And so we can take some inspiration from there and uh, use that. So I'm going to, for now, just stipulate, and I'll tell you why I'm stipulating this in just a second. But let's just stipulate that the anti-symmetrized connecting field will be the torsion tensor. We know that. And we're going to set that equal to two times this uh, smooth rank one, one tensor field, call it FAB. And when you set anti-symmetrized FAB on the lowered index with the temporal metric, that's going to be the torsion tensor. Okay, so why this kind of form? Well, because that we have a lot of flexibility and freedom, we can choose a pretty simple form. And I'm not claiming that this is the only way to introduce torsion into the classical space-time context, but it is one way that has some nice features. One feature that's nice is that uh, it will give us this kind of force equation that we were looking for, 
Um, and so you can sort of plug through the math, but basically you just get uh, this FAN field for the uh, force felt by the particle, and that's directly related to the torsion. So that's nice. Uh, another nice feature is that we will get this field equation. And this field equation, if we take a special case where FAB is going to be a uh, phi ATB, we will be able to recover Poisson's equation in the limit, or as a special case, rather. And so if we take this FAB field to be the torsion tensor, it will be able to recover Poisson's equation as a special case, but we can think about it as a generalization to the standard Newtonian uh, approach. Okay, so as I mentioned, this isn't the only way to do it, but my goal in this part of the talk is to show how you can construct a classical space-time retortion. Not to say that this is the only way or a unique way, but just to show that it is possible to do. Okay. So to take stock at this point, we have a notion of absolute time in our theory. We have a derivative operator with non-vanishing space-time torsion compatible with the two metrics. And then we have the relevant force and field equations uh, that we like. Okay. Um, I won't go, the, go through the full proposition here, but if there's any interest in uh, the, the proposition showing that you can do this, I can do so in the Q&A. So I want to do a quick interlude here because there are some claims in the physics literature <clears throat> about classical space times with torsion that I want to give some proper treatment of. So there's a few different papers that look at torsional newton carton gravity. Uh, and they develop what they call a twistless torsional newton carton theory. <clears throat> and in this theory, they have a temporal metric that's hypersurface orthogonal, but it's not closed. And so what they are able to derive is the foliation of the space time, but they don't have a notion of absolute time. And so you might wonder like, how is it even possible that they get this foliation without a notion of absolute time and without a closed temporal metric? And what they do is they'll appeal to Frobenius' theorem. And so that gives us uh, that gives them a slightly weaker condition than a closed temporal metric. So they only have to have that the temporal metric, partial of the temporal metric, all anti-symmetrized is zero to get a foliation. And so that's slightly weaker than requiring the temporal metric to be closed. But it goes further. And the kinds of claims that you see that are prominent in this literature include the following. So they say, the absence of, of torsion implies that the temporal vial line, we can just think of this as the temporal metric for now, corresponds to a closed form form and can be used to define an absolute time in space time. Twistless torsional newton carton geometry is characterized by the fact that the temporal vial line is hypersurface orthogonal, but not necessarily closed. Okay, so what they're saying is that the absence of torsion is what is going to uh, result in the uh, uh, the temporal vial line being hypersurface orthogonal and not necessarily closed. So uh, here's another quote that illustrates this. They say the boundary geometry becomes Newton Carton, i.e., it has no torsion if and only if we take the temporal vial line or temporal metric to be closed. And so what they're trying to say is that a closed temporal metric is incompatible with torsion in the classical space-time context. But this is a problem, especially for the project as I've just described it, because I just showed you how to construct a classical space-time with torsion and a closed temporal metric. And so there's this question here about why this literature is claiming that you cannot have a closed temporal metric and also have torsion. And the answer is pretty simple. What they're doing is that at an earlier step, they're requiring the form of the connecting field to be such that the only way that it would be, uh, that it would be closed would be for the torsion to vanish. Basically, what they've done is say, 
that the only anti-symmetric component is this first bit. So everything that I've put in purple here is going to always be symmetric. And so the anti-symmetric component is restricted to this first bit here. And if the temporal metric is closed, then of course the torsion will vanish because this anti-symmetric component will have to vanish. But what I want to highlight here is that this is a consequence of their choice of connection that came earlier. So these claims that you see made in the literature that say that having a closed temporal metric is incompatible with torsion are only a consequence of this earlier commitment to the connection having this particular form. But they don't specify this. What they say is, in general, there's no way to have torsion in a closed temporal metric for a classical space time. Okay, so hopefully I've shown you how to resolve this issue. And in fact, we can construct classical space times with closed temporal metrics and torsion. Um, and what I should highlight as well is that uh, the kind of uh, connection that they're picking has a bigger picture kind of how it fits with their projects. So what they're trying to do is construct a torsional classical limit of general relativity. And because they're looking at general relativity to begin with, they're trying to recover something that will look akin to the levy trivita connection. And so this is all sort of part of a bigger picture project. So there are good reasons that they're picking the form of the connection that they are, but then they're sort of generalizing the, the uh, commitment to the temporal metric um, not being allowed to be closed. Okay. So uh, let me show you just the proposition. I won't go through the full proof, but this is the proposition that shows that you can in fact have a classical space time uh, with torsion and a closed temporal metric. And this is a uh, collaborative work with Jim Weatherall. Okay. So uh, the proposition goes as follows. So let M T A H A B N na blah tilde be a classical space time, no torsion, and it's going to satisfy some common curvature conditions. So what we're starting with is a model of new Cartan theory. Then given any point P and M, there's going to be an open set containing P and a pair of nabla and this FAB field that I presented earlier on our open set, where nabla is a derivative operator, FAB is the smooth rank 1, 1 tensor field, and together these satisfy the following conditions. Nabla is compatible with TA and HAB, nabla is flat, nabla has torsion, and the torsion is equal to the anti-symmetrized FAB with TC. And then it satisfies the force and field equation that I gave before. Last bit, the pair is not unique. There exist other pairs satisfying the conditions for which the torsion is not vanishing. So basically what we're doing is recreating the trapping style results, but allowing for torsion. So it's a kind of generalization. Okay some observations about these results. So the first is that we show non-uniqueness, but unlike the original Chapman recovery theorem, we're not giving necessary and sufficient conditions to construct new pairs. There you can give necessary and sufficient conditions, um, but here, um, unlike in the case with the vanishing the torsion, like you have with Troutman, the derivative operators associated with the models of the torsional theory don't appear to form an affine space. Uh, but we still are able to establish the non-uniqueness of torsional models, but we have to do a kind of uh, stipulative kind of proof. Like we can't show you how to construct new models, but we are able to establish non-uniqueness. Uh, and then the second point is that we do not require the models of newton cartan gravity to satisfy the further uh, curvature condition that you do in the Chapman results, where uh, RABCD is equal to RCDAB. Uh, and so you can think about this as a generalization of the original theorem. The reason is because uh, the role of this condition before was to show that a certain field was closed and therefore locally exact, but we don't actually need to show this for our results, and so uh, we don't impose the condition. Okay, so let me give you a summary of this part one. Uh, what we've done is shown that you can construct a classical analog of teleparallel gravity that has a closed temporal metric and space-time torsion. I hope to have shown you that once we relax the condition of symmetry that we have on the um, connecting fields, 
we have a lot of freedom actually. And so one, I've just shown you one way to allow for torsion in the theory, but there are many other ways to construct a torsional classical model. Uh, I didn't go through this in much detail, but I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. Many of the familiar properties that we uh, take for granted, like just even curvature, have to be redefined in the context that you allow for torsion. And so a lot of the familiar um, propositions have to be re-derived with these uh, new definitions. Okay. So the second part of the talk is going to be going through uh, the limiting proposition of how you can take the classical limit of teleparallel gravity and what you get in the end. And so the, the goal here is that I've shown you how you can construct a classical space-time with torsion. And now I hope that you have this question of, is that actually the classical limit of teleparallel gravity? Great. Just like before, I'm gonna start with some of the classical results uh, and use that to guide our reasoning for the torsion case. So when we're thinking about the classical limit of general relativity, what we're doing is we're considering the light cones and allowing the speed of light to go to infinity. When we do that, we have that GAB when it's lowered will get in the limit TATB. However, if you think about the opening up of the light cones, you'll realize that the spatial distances become unbounded as the speed of light is allowed to go to infinity. You can parameterize this in different ways, but uh, the way that we're following here is that you're going to define lambda, which is one over C squared, and use that to re-parameterize or rescale your spatial distances. So GAB raised, we're going to rescale by lambda so it doesn't explode. Uh, and that's going to get us the spatial metric in the limit. Okay. So this is a, a famous result by Malamut in 1982. So here's the proposition. He says, suppose GAB lambda is a one parameter family of Lorentz metrics and TA and HAB are, as I just outlined them. Then you have a derivative operator satisfying the following condition. At each step along the way, at each lambda, it will uh, be a model of GR, and it will reduce to the classical derivative operator as lambda goes to zero. MTA, HAB, and alpha A is then going to be a classical space-time model satisfying the particular curvature condition you need. Great. So this gives us what uh, a, like a, a checklist of what we might expect in the limit of teleparallel gravity as well. So what we want is that uh, we'll begin with a model of teleparallel gravity, just like we began with a model of GR. And then we're going to allow the light cones to open up and consider the behavior of the tetrads along the way. I say tetrads here because uh, standardly people present models of teleparallel gravity in terms of tetrads. So I'll be showing how to do it with a tetrad approach. Uh, we want to show the convergence of the derivative operators. And then we want to show the reduction of the tetrads along the way to what I'm going to call a classical tetrad. And I'll go into detail about what I mean by a classical tetrad in just a minute. But basically, uh, we want some kind of representation of the temporal and spatial metrics in the tetrad formalism. Uh, and then again, highlighting the temporal metric that we recover in the limit should be closed. OK, so this is what we want out of our limit. So let's start by uh, looking at this classical uh, tetrad kind of approach. Okay, so when we consider tetrads in teleparallel gravity, typically people will define the metric as this combination of tetrad terms. So GIB is typically the summation from I of one to four of the Minkowski metric components multiplied by tetrad components. And then GIB raised is the same, but we raise our Minkowski uh, metric components. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that this, um, these tetrads are going to converge to these classical tetrads, or the classical ones I'm denoting with the Fs. And we're going to call a tetrad a classical one 
if and only if one of the cotetrad elements is closed. That's the equivalent of the temporal metric being closed. So this cotetrad element is going to correspond to the uh, temporal metric. All the other cotetrad elements we're going to ask to vanish. So all of the other ones where F2A, F3A, etc., we're going to ask to vanish. The first element of the tetrad, uh, not the cotetrad, but the tetrad element will vanish, corresponding to the uh, orthogonality of the metric. Uh, and then the summation of all the other tetrad elements will yield the spatial metric in the limit. So if you sum over all of them raised, you'll get the spatial metric in the limit and have that on that last line. Okay. So the classical limit of general relativity, we have GAB going to TATB and lambda times GAB raised going to minus HAB. And in this case, we're going to have the summation of the um, tetrad component yielding if it's uh, with the raised counting index, then only the first one will remain in the limit and that will give us the temporal metric. And if it's the lowered counting index, then we're going to sum from two to four, dropping the first one. Now, again, we have to rescale them uh, just like we did in general relativity. But this time, because we're working with a single tetrad component, I've rescaled it by the square root of lambda. OK, so this sets up how we expect the tetrads to behave in the limit. And the intuition is just like you have with general relativity, except that we have to do it slightly differently because of the tetrad components. Okay, so let me now show you the proposition. So suppose that you have a one parameter family of tetrads on your manifold and this classical tetrad satisfies the conditions that I had on the previous slide. Now suppose that you have a derivative operator such that the derivative operators along the way as you're opening up the light cones, um, allowing C to go to infinity, lambda to go to zero, converges to this uh, particular derivative operator. Uh, then this derivative operator, an alpha A, is such that you get a classical space-time model where you have a classical tetrad and an alpha A is flat. And here's the kicker, for any derivative operator in ABLA A that satisfies the above, in other words, for any derivative operator that you converge to in the limit, the torsion will vanish. And this is really striking. What's going on here is we're saying, if you want your derivative operators to converge to a classical derivative operator, a flat one, that you get this classical tetrad, then you, the torsion must vanish. There's no other way to get convergence with the derivative operators. Now, again, I'm not going to go through the full details of the proof, but let me just show you why this is the case. The proof is going to require that we consider the relations between the derivative operators along the way. And this is standardly given by what are called the C fields or the connecting field. So these are the fields that relate any derivative operator to the derivative operator at the previous step of taking the limit. So when we write out the C field expression, we have on that first line all the same terms that you would do when you're doing the classical limit of general relativity. And in the purple, you have the new torsional terms. Now, when you expand these torsion terms, you get an expression that has a one over lambda to the three halves um, out front. And so as lambda goes to zero, this term is going to blow up. And so if you need, if you want your derivative operators to converge, then you need your C fields to be bounded. And if you want your C fields to be bounded, you can't have this term blowing up, which means it has to go to zero. But if this term goes to zero, the only way that it can do that is if the torsion is going to vanish wholesale. And so working backwards, the torsion vanishes, which allows the C fields to be bounded, which then allows your derivative operators to converge in the limit. Okay, so what we showed is that a, you can have a classical space-time with torsion, but B, you can't get it as the classical limit of teleparallel gravity. 
Now, um, let me go through a surprising implication of this result. So in teleparallel gravity, the acceleration of test particles is given by the contorsion tensor. So this contorsion tensor I have here as a combination of these torsion terms. If the torsion is going to vanish for our theory in the limit, that means that in the classical limit, the theory that we get out, it has no torsion, so it has no contorsion, and so it has no acceleration of test particles. In other words, the, there are just no gravitational effects at all in this theory that we get as the classical limit of teleparallel gravity. That's pretty striking. <laughs> Okay, and let me just go through again some uh, um, some ways that we can relate it to the standard uh, limit of general relativity. So when we consider the limit of general relativity, there are two main propositions that uh, that we can show. The first is that we have a one parameter family of Lorentz metrics. This is the same proposition I gave before, and that we get convergence to a classical space-time model. And then the second proposition has to do with the matter fields and the behavior of the matter fields in the limit. Now, as you know, the classical limit of general relativity is newton cartan theory, and so what we see is squeezing out of the uh, spatial curvature. But it's actually with the second proposition, when we consider the behavior of the matter fields, that we get the squeezing out of the spatial curvature in the GR context. Uh, that's pretty striking because actually in the limit of teleparallel gravity, it's the convergence of the derivative operators in the first place that requires the torsion to vanish. So we see a similar kind of behavior where we see the squeezing out of the curvature in GR and the squeezing out of the torsion in teleparallel gravity as you take their classical limits. But in the GR case, it was because of the behavior of the matter fields. But in the teleparallel gravity case, it's the required convergence of the derivative operators that gets you the squeezing out kind of behavior. Okay. So the last thing I want to cover is uh, some, prop uh, some proposals of taking the classical limit of teleparallel gravity or of other theories, uh, like other approaches to taking this limit than the one that I've shown you. Um, so there are a few different papers that try to do this. In this one paper by Hanson, Hartong, and Overs, they say torsional Newton-Cartan theory is actually the correct framework just to describe general relativity in the non-relativistic limit. This is a pretty strange claim because as we well know, Standard Newton Cartan theory is a very good description of general relativity in the non relativistic limit. And so uh, this torsional version um, is an interesting claim that they're making. And a related paper by Philip Schwartz that came out this year, he looks at a teleparallel version of Newton Cartan theory and claims that this theory arises as the large speed of light limit of the teleparallel equivalent of GR. Again, striking because what I've just shown you is that there's no way of maintaining torsion in the classical limit of teleparallel gravity, and yet he wants to say that uh, there's a teleparallel version of Newton-Cartan theory in which you can do so. Okay, so this kind of presents this puzzle. Uh, some claim to get a torsional theory as the classical limit of teleparallel gravity, and some even claim it to be the classical limit of general relativity. And so you might wonder, how is it that they're doing this? Uh, and what I want to argue is that they have a different conception of what they're doing in the classical limit that is allowing them to get these different results. So what I've shown you is what has been called the geometric approach in the literature. And as I've described it, you consider your light cones and you allow your light cones to open up, which corresponds to uh, allowing your speed of light to go to infinity and considering the behavior. There's another approach to taking the classical limit where you expand the metric and the matter fields of the theory you're starting with in powers of 1 over c or 1 over c squared. And this is thought to be valid approximation for a low velocity and weak field limit and typically goes under the name of the 1 over c or 1 over c squared expansion approach. Now, um, the geometric approach has some benefits. One benefit I would like to really highlight is that it allows you to talk about models of the theory that you started with along the way. 
So as you open up the light cones, at every point in this opening up process, you have a model of the theory that you started with. You're still requiring all of the same properties you expected of, say, general relativity to hold in this model as you open up the light cones, and it's only in the limit that you get a classical space-time back. Uh, and so that's one benefit. But a worry that some people point to is what it means for, say, allowing a constant of nature like the speed of light to vary, and then how we're supposed to understand these counterfactual models, especially, they argue, if we intend this to do explanatory work. The idea here is, if you want to be able to explain why it was that a classical theory was a valid approximation for uh, relativistic theory, then it's kind of strange to appeal to these counterfactual models of if the speed of light were such and such, then it would be like, then you would get it back in the limit. That seems like a strange process for doing this kind of explanatory work. Uh, the one over C or one over C squared expansion approach, on the other hand, seems to do more explanatory work because it shows how the previous theory was successfully approximating the current one. But on the other hand, I'm not really sure how to understand the conceptual structure of the theories being compared. We can't talk about theories along the way. We can't talk about um, what kind of theory we get back when we do this kind of expansion in powers of one over C or one over C squared. And so this is one of the reasons that they're able to get torsion in the classical limit of something like GR. In the geometric approach, you would never be able to do this because you would never have allowed your connection to not be symmetric. You would always maintain this condition of symmetry on the connection along the way. So you'd never be able to get a torsional theory in the limit. But if you do the 1 over C or 1 over C squared expansion approach, you don't have the same worry about models of the theory along the way. And so that's how you're able to introduce torsion into an otherwise torsion-free context. Okay, so these are two different approaches. I think there's pros and cons with either, but I think that there's real worries about what's going on and how we're talking about theories relating to other theories if we adopt this second approach. So my takeaway is if we're thinking about comparing theories to one another, the geometric approach certainly seems much more suitable. If we're worried about the empirical success of a path theory, then you might consider using, I think, this expansion approach. Okay, so let me just summarize the second part uh, of the talk. What I've shown you is that we can construct a classical analog of teleparallel gravity that has a closed temporal metric and has space-time torsion. Um, that was in the first half. And in the second half, I showed that this classical theory of gravity with torsion is not the classical limit of teleparallel gravity. In fact, standard Newtonian gravity, no torsion is. And when you consider the behavior of Einstein's equation, Malmet showed that the classical limit squeezes out the spatial curvature, but here the classical limit squeezes out the torsion. It does so in a slightly different way. It does so by uh, looking at the deriv derivative operators and requiring them to converge instead of looking at the matter fields. But nonetheless, you still see this squeezing out behavior. Okay, so I'll leave you with this schematic of what I've shown. So we know the relationship between general relativity and if you take the classical limit, you get new Cartan theory. And then Troutman uh, results show you how to move between Newton Cartan theory and Newtonian gravity. What I've shown in the first half of the talk is that you can construct a torsional classical gravity. If you start with Newton Cartan theory, uh, you can introduce torsion. And then what I've shown in the second half of the talk is that if you start with teleparallel gravity, there's no way to maintain torsion in the limit. And what you get back is a version of Newtonian gravity without any gravitational influences. Okay, so thank you all so much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. All right, welcome back everybody. We're gonna start the Q&A. Uh, please raise your hand if you have questions. Okay, I'm happy to kick things off. So I have a first question, Helen. Um, so I'm I'm a little curious about the Weizenbach connection. 
Um, in particular, I'm trying to understand um, how to think about it, how to think about it intuitively. Let's let's take a, a familiar manifold. L let's take a sphere, a two a, a, a two sphere. So the Weizenbach connection is it defined for a two dimensional manifold or, or is it special to four dimensional manifolds? Oh, uh, I've only seen it on defined in the context of tall parallel gravity. So I right, don't... right, okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I I don't know enough about it to be able to say like is it defined at a two manifold. But my my question would be if I have a sphere. And the sphere is embedded in an ambient 3D space. So it just looks, it looks like the surface of a sphere. You know, there's an inherited metric, an induced metric on the sphere that it gets from the surrounding space. Uh, and this is the usual metric that we know and love for a sphere, for a two-sphere. Um, and it's the metric that if we compute like uh, the, you know, the Riemann tensor, we compute the curvature, we get the standard formulas for like the curvature of the sphere. We find the sphere is curved you know, it, it positive curvature, um, the Ricci scalar, if you compute it, you know, has a, a curvature that goes like one over um, the radius of the sphere squared, right? And it has this property that the limit is the radius goes to infinity, the Ricci tensor goes to zero. It, it like captures our familiar notion of what it means for a sphere to be curved. Um, if the Weizenbach connection is defined on the sphere, does it assign the sphere no curvature? I guess this is where I'm a little bit confused, right? Like, um, obviously in GR, we're not assuming that you have an embedded, like we're not assuming that the four dimensional manifold of space time lives in a higher uh, higher dimensional space. So we don't have like a notion of standing outside of space time and asking, is it truly curved? Is it not truly mm -hmm. curved? But for a sphere, if you're embedded in 3D space, we have this intuition that it's curved. The Riemann curvature captures that. Um, and I'm just curious what, what the Weizenbach connection has to say, it says that there's no curvature assigned to the sphere, or, or does it? That's that's where I guess I'm I'm confused. Well, it, so yeah, it would give us the torsion that would be the equivalent of the curvature. So typically in this work, at least, I've redefined the curvature to have the Riemann curvature and the torsion component, uh, and so it would trade off these two. Yeah, that... yeah. I, I'm just the Weizenbach connection seems very abstract to me. I mean, of course, Riem Riemann <laughs> curvature can also be very abstract, especially when you're not imagining that your manifold is embedded in an ambient space. Um, it's like intrinsic curvature. It's related to the failure of parallel transport to be uh, path path independent. But of course, your definition of parallel transport depends on having a, a choice of connection, and you've already chosen the levi civita connection. If you choose the Weizenbach connection, then you get a different story. So I'm just like groping around for a different picture where I have some intuitive understanding of what curvature means. So I can ask which of these is better capturing what I mean by curvature. But um, yeah, because otherwise in a four dimensional space time, I just don't have any intuition about whether there is or is not curvature. It depends on definitions. It depends on you know what you're taking your connection to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was in I, general. I really struggle with developing intuitions for how to represent or visualize torsion. So, <laughs> uh, the next hand I have is Peter. Peter, please go ahead. Uh, mute it, unmute it. Um, excuse me, finger troubles. Um, hello, Peter. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hey, um, so it, I was curious, um, one, how the community who've been working on teleparallel gravity have been responding to uh, the um, the introduction of non-matricity that's been coming along uh, in the last few years. Uh, as obviously, that introduces an extra layer of um, of um, under determination. Uh, but well, as I say, I, I'm curious how how your community uh, has been reacting to that. Peter, would you mind elaborating what you mean by non-matricity? <laughs> well, there's a there's a tall order. Um, I, I'll uh, I guess I'm referring to Lavinia Heisenberg's recent review on FQ gravity, and there's an article of hers in Universe uh, from 2021, uh, in which uh, instead of considering torsion, the you still have a metric uh, and a flat metric. Uh, instead of adding on torsion as an additional as an additional on top of the metric, you add on non-matricity so that uh, 
no, I can't do it in, in three words. <laughs> can I put Helen on the on How about the spot? four? Can you do it in four words? <laughs> Perhaps Helen can, uh, but I don't really want to put her on the spot about that. Really, it's more, I'm more just interested in how the community has responded to that aspect. Okay, so I will clarify that I'm a philosopher, so I am not part of the Teleparallel Gravity community. Oh, okay. Um, I am not totally sure how the Teleparallel Gravity community feels about it, but I do know, uh, okay, yeah, maybe we can ask a little bit, but I do know that there is a lot of interest in non-metricity from these people that talk about the geometrical trinity of gravity, right. uh, and there has been recent work from philosophers, uh, also James Reed and Will Wolf, about uh, that and trying to develop a non-metric classical theory so they might have a better sense of how that is received right. like amongst okay. folks uh, in, uh, in the community but in general I think that maybe the people have different goals like I think that people in teleparallel gravity have eyes to uh, uh different applications in quantum context but people that are doing the geometric trinity have more of uh like future developments in gravitational theories kind of goals that's pretty big so i'm not yeah, totally... that's fine I, I had a second question uh completely unconnected but slightly more connected to your work um and that is that um I, I'm, I find myself concerned about the element of uh, teleparallel gravity not being globally equivalent to um, to uh, general relativity, uh, and particularly um, in the quantum gravity kind of context, where um, the the curvature might well be such that the um, the the global structure could be different even on the very very small scale. If you have uh, non-trivial topological features, such as foams and so on, uh, in which case um, teleparallelism won't be won't be capable of describing things which uh, which can be described by general relativity. So, it, I, as I say, it concerns me that that is uh, an aspect of this kind of. I mean, I would love to work with teleparallelism because <laughs> you can work on a flat space time. <laughs> I mean, why would you why would you not want to do that at least locally? But if locally excludes that kind of structure on the Planck scale, but but who knows at what level that would come. So again, how would you see that kind of worry about teleparallelism? Good, yeah. Um, to be honest, I think that there are more worrisome things around. <laughs> okay. In particular, I'm thinking uh, of this argument that Eleanor Knox makes where uh, Basically, she's saying like teleparallel gravity has been engineered to give you back what you wanted from general relativity. So um, I think that, uh, so Jim Weather and I'll, Weatherall and I have this other paper where we're trying to argue, suppose that you do accept that they're empirically equivalent. What can you say about their theoretical equivalence of these two theories? And what we end up arguing is that teleparallel gravity is positing this excess structure in order to get back the predictions of general relativity in some sense, right? Like what you're doing is you're picking out uh, a particular um, class of tetrads that you're gonna care about and um, that's kind of this excess structure that makes it less appealing of a theory in the first place. So if you are worried about um, which one you ought to take to represent the world, practically, I don't know I, that I can help, but it, sort of stepping back, I have more pressing worries about why one would use teleparallel gravity in the first place. One of the things that Lavinia Heisenberg's recent uh, paper on the archive uh, goes through is the number of degrees of freedom uh, for all three. Um, and it comes out the same. And there is excess structure uh, for the metric uh, presentation as well, after all, uh, because uh, you have to factor in different morphism invariants. Uh, and you end up with two degrees of freedom in all three after you've taken account of that extra extra structure so there's extra structure in all three um, oh interesting okay 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's well worth. It's almost always well, well worth reading Lavinia Heisenberg. But but for this, uh, it's uh, it really expands on the uh, the Trinity paper in Universe of a couple of years ago. Um, okay, I'll have to yeah. take a look then because I have. Right, you'll find it easily, of course. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I did notice this in the chat, but Felipe says that um, offered to clarify uh, this this uh, non metricity. Um, Felipe, you want to go ahead? Yeah. So hi. Basically, uh, I worked in metric affine gravity a couple of years ago, and um, I don't. I arrived late, so I don't know if you clarified what. Uh, or you talked about uh, parallel transport when describing the torsion. And non-metricity can be understood basically as another component of that. Uh, when you do parallel transport of a vector alongside a curve, you never uh, modify the length of the vectors. That's basically because you... Uh, in uh, Einstein-Cartan or in general relativity, you always make the assumption that the covariant derivatives will commute with the metric. If you drop that assumption, you define the covariant derivative of the metric as a new tensor that it's called the non-metricity. Uh, when you do parallel transport, you can have the variation of the lengths of the vectors after parallel transport. So that basically is, is you drop another assumption of the theory. Right, and then you end up with a new field that characterizes yeah. the, th yeah, I see, okay, got it. That's very helpful. Um, I guess my, my question to, to, to you, uh, Peter, and I guess everybody here is, um, so you, one of your concerns about the, the potential uh, failure of agreement um, globally between uh, teleparallel gravity and general relativity um, is that there may be some reasons to suppose that there can be global changes to, to space-time and quantum gravity, and if the two theories don't agree globally, then maybe you can't capture these things with teleparallel gravity. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, you know, the, the usual way that we think about quantum gravity is we, we, we begin by thinking in terms of you know, Einstein's standard theory of general relativity, that's our starting place. And then it makes sense if you start there and attempt to quantize it, you may get features that, that, don't, look, that don't look right or can't be captured properly in teleparallel gravity. Is it obvious that if you start with teleparallel gravity and attempt to quantize that, and you work within teleparallel gravity, is it obvious that you're gonna get features that it cannot? So in other words, let me phrase it a different way. Anytime you have two physical theories that coincide at the level of all, all of our empirical access, as, as far as I understand general relativity in the standard formulation and teleparallel gravity do, but may not agree outside of where we have empirical access, um, then, then if we attempt to embed either of these theories into a larger, more correct theory, like a theory of quantum gravity, we now potentially have different paths that we can take. And it, it's not obvious to me which path is then the correct path. So I don't, I don't have any, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, so we don't know the answer to that question. Okay, I was asking a question to, I don't know, the... <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of don't really want to answer in a way, but but, yeah. but still, I mean, I don't want we'll do other people to ask other questions. Uh, but but still, it, it seems to me that it's perfectly possible that teleparallelism would be, would be adequate at all scales, uh, because we don't have, like you say, we have no empirical evidence. Uh, on the other hand, um, if there is... Uh, a non-trivial topological structure within a general relativistic construction, then that would be very difficult to represent uh, with a flat space-time. Just as you you have to work in an atlas kind of uh, arrangement, just as we do for describing a sphere with a, in terms of a flat plane, you have to introduce two atlas uh, two maps into your atlas, atlas to yes. do it properly, right. yeah. which you can do. But on the other hand, if there's a huge plethora of structure. So there's billions or you know, 10 to the hundreds uh, of uh, gravity of structure at very small scales, then your atlas is going to be horrible. Um, 
So I have, I have, um, I, I don't see their hands raised. I have a whole bunch more questions. I hope it's all right. I'll, I'll ask questions that if people have uh, questions that are second order corrections to my questions or, or non-perturbative corrections, that's all good. Um, so Helen, I, I, I'd like to understand a little bit more about the history of telepower gravity. Do you, do you, how much do you know about the history of it? I, I'd love if you could tell us a little more about like where it came from. Um, uh, and, um, that's that's a good starting question. Did you know the history? I'm curious. Um, I can recount what I know of the history, but I'm no historian by any means. So the history that I know is that Einstein was really interested in it uh, for these purported extra degrees of freedom that torsion will allow you. And there's some good correspondence between Einstein and Weizmach and Einstein and Cartan, where he's writing to them. Uh, you know roughly this when this I, was, and did Einstein originate the idea, or was it someone else? Uh, oh, maybe this is a hand that. Can oh, Stephen, do you have something to add to this? <laughs> oh no, this is a totally unrelated. Ah, uh, hang on then. Yeah. Um, I can look up. I summarized this in my dissertation, but I don't remember the years offhand on account of. Of course, yes. That, that not being but, but, you know, was this was this Einstein's idea, or did someone else have this idea? Um, so I believe that it's Einstein's idea to begin with, um, but that, I mean, obviously the Weizenbach connection, um, he was told, Einstein was told uh, that Weizenbach had presented this at a lecture that Einstein had been at previously. Uh, so anyway, so he is in correspondence with Cartan and Weizenbach. Uh, eventually he comes to not be able to use the extra degrees of freedom for unifying the electromagnetic field and gravity. And so he kind of loses interest. And then folks took it up much later uh, with this new general relativity bent to it. So that's what they called it. And then yet again, one more time, this group, Alger Body and Pereira, et cetera, took it up again uh, for like most recently in their teleparallel gravity book and larger projects. Um, I, I suppose that the most recent history of this is with the geometrical trinity kinds of projects. Um, but that's much. about as, yeah. <laughs> Stephen, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Um. I um. I, I have a probably a very naive question. Um. You know. You you said that um in uh that teleparallel gravity has you know you engineer it to obviously to reproduce uh gr. Um. There's you know there's some interest in modifications of general relativity like f of r gravity to try to do things like um you know. Uh, account for the acceleration of the expansion of the universe without dark energy, things like that. And I'm wondering if the, um, you know, the other theories that you can get from the teleparallel approach without sort of engineering it to um, to match general relativity empirically are, if they um, are in general equivalent to, um, to like F of R type um, theories that modify general relativity, or if they if that's a an avenue that yields new, you know, potential modifications to to GR. Um. Yes. Yeah, so there's also f of t theories where you introduce right. functions of the torsion tensor into the action. Um. Largely, I would say that the motivations are quite different. So for the teleparallel gravity folks, their motivations are to reproduce the effects of general relativity. For the modified gravity folks, obviously, they want to use the modifications in order to do extra things. So yes, there are ways like FFT theories that will get you different results than you would get in general relativity. Uh, but the folks doing the teleparallel equivalent of GR are really just trying to get back the same results because they want to present a theory that's empirically equivalent. Um, but I, I guess my question is, would, it, would modifying teleparallel gravity be an avenue to try to, to, try to do this, this, the same thing that people who are mod modifying GR are doing, or would that just yield equivalent theories to modifications of GR? Oh, so think like, oh, F of R, but you're doing an F of R, but starting with a teleparallel right, right. background or something. Right. 
Um, I am not sure. Uh, I think that if you were doing that, you would be in the like Poincaré gauge theory kind of approach because you'd have both torsion and curvature. Uh, and once you're there, there's lots of things that you you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, and so I'd say like if you are doing a modified gravity, if you have torsion in the background, the modifications you're making, if you're making them in terms of curvature, then you've kind of switched to a different. So I haven't seen people do this, um, but maybe because the way that people would be doing this is on a Poincaré gauge theory approach. Thanks, uh, I don't so know I have... if anybody has any other sense of that or wants to respond to that question, but that that's my kind of understanding. Um, so if there are no follow-ups, I have a, another question, Helen, that, that may be an annoying question because I know I've asked asked you it before. Um, uh, but hopefully I can like phrase it in a way that, that's a little sharper. Um, so if I take the Einstein field equation and I just uh, disassemble it into, you know, the metric tensor itself and partial derivatives, not even covariate. I just, I just disassemble, I disassemble the Riemann tensor into the Christoffel coefficients. I disassemble the Christoffel coefficients. So all I've got left is a bunch of metric tensors and partial derivatives, um, you know, on, 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 you know, on, I guess the left-hand side of the Einstein field equation and anywhere, you know, the metric shows up, I just, I make the metric explicit on the right-hand side. So now all I've got is the metric tensor, partial derivatives and various matter fields in the Einstein field equation. Um, this equation has some very important um, invariance properties. It's coordinate invariant, it's diffeomorphism invariant. You know, all of the metric tensor appearances and partial derivatives are all, they all appear in just the right way to give me a coordinate invariant and diffeomorphism invariant equation that has the right properties. But it will look very messy. And so one view is that you can take these equations and and combine the metric tensor and partial derivatives up and reconstruct the Christoffel coefficients and eventually the Riemann tensor and then present it in terms of Riemann tensor and say, look, there's Riemann curvature. Another thing I could do is take the metric tensor and I suppose express it in terms of uh, uh, tetras if they're available uh, and then construct the Weizenbach connection and then just rewrite the Ensfield equation in terms of the Weizenbach connection. I guess my question is, am I doing anything physical um, if I choose to scoop together sort of, you call this like raw raw general relativity, just written directly in terms of partial derivatives of the metric tensor. Am I doing anything physical if I collect together the raw ingredients and, and, and decide to express them in terms of Riemann curvature, or if I decide to take the raw ingredients and express them in terms of Weizenbach connection? Like, is there any physical difference between those two things? I guess that's, Maybe that's a sharper version of a question I know I've asked before. I guess because I'm okay. asking is ontologically to... different or something. Right. I just, the... I just don't know. Like, sure. is this because we keep talking about maybe these are physically different theories or not? Obviously, to get to 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 um, uh, to to uh, a telepallet gravity, I had to assume that my manifold was parallelizable so that I could do this trick and take my metric tensor and write it in terms of well-defined tetrad fields and construct the Weizenbach connection. So. So I do have to make that that assumption that my manifold is nice enough that I can I can combine the metric tensor in, into this new structure. So I guess in that sense I am making a physical assumption. Um, so maybe that, but is that it, or or am I it, certainly if I have, if I have a space time manifold that's parallelizable, then it's just sort of not clear to me what I'm what the physical meaning is of deciding to package the raw ingredients of the Riemann manifold, the pseudo Riemannian manifold in one way versus another. So why should I call these different physical theories? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, the way that I think about it is in terms of theoretical equivalence. So, I, I mean, I don't know if this is the kind of question you're after, but you could ask, are these just theoretically equivalent? Suppose that they are empirically equivalent, like where in the hierarchy would you stop? And I think you would just stop the next step after uh, empirical equivalence. And you would say, setting aside these worries that Peter has brought up about whether or not there is actually extra um, assumptions that you're making in teleparallel gravity, uh, 
supposing that as I described that there is, you would say they're not theoretically equivalent because teleparallel gravity has this extra excess structure that is that you don't have to assume in the context of GR because you have a unique connection picked out. The uniqueness is like getting around these further assumptions that you would have to make in the TPG approach. And so if you stop there, you just say, well, one has excess structure, they're not theoretically equivalent. And that allows me to say that they're uh, empirically equivalent, but I have good reason to believe- The uniqueness you mean for uh, the levy to connection is that once you mm -hmm. impose torsion-free and metric compatibility, that there's a unique expression mm -hmm. for the, okay, yeah. That's fair. Yeah. All right. I other mean, um, and, and let me I'll also say, like, another way of thinking about this is, like, how committed are you to thinking that Newton Carton theory and Newtonian gravity are the same and describing in the same way? So, if you think that that's the same, then you might think that this is the same kind of situation that you had there. Good. Um, next hand is from Madeline. Madeline, go ahead. This is kind of piggybacking <clears throat> off of that last question, but um, I'm kind of relatively new to general relativity. Um, and I'm curious, what types of empirical information can we apply to different space-time models? Like, is there, you know, a certain set of things that we could hold up and say, okay, this matches or doesn't match this model that you guys are saying is equivalent between the two theories? Is that what I'm, if I'm understanding that correctly? Uh, so... Are you asking, like, how would I actually empirically distinguish between general relativity and, say, teleparallel gravity? Yes, or, you know, in as I, I, sit, I hear you guys saying, um, what sorts of empirical, you know, data can prove both? Or, like, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to distinguish between the two, but just, yeah. Oh. Uh, sure. So anything that proves one ought to prove the other if we buy into these claims about empirical equivalence of the two theories. Uh, at least, I mean, what we'll get empirically is local information. Uh, so we anything that we have in support of general relativity, insofar as teleparallel gravity is constructed to so have the same empirical consequences, will also support teleparallel gravity. In terms of what we have in support of general relativity, um, I mean, one thing you might think is the lensing, gravitational lensing results will give you support of uh, general relativity. So this is like, if you have an object in the foreground and something in the background, the light emitted by the background objects gets lensed by the foreground until you end up with these like duplicate images and that's taken to be a supporting uh, data point of general relativity. Is that the kind of thing that you're asking? Yeah, I just, um, yeah, I'm curious, like, because I think that was a good answer to that question. <laughs> good. Um, thanks, Madeline. Uh, and thanks, Helen. Um, are there any other questions? I also saw the chat. Thank you for the reference. Yeah, thanks, Peter. All right. Well, Helen did finish. Uh, you finished your talk a little early. We're we're we're. Uh, looks like we're we're maybe running down the discussion a little early. That's fine. Um, so, if there are no further questions, I think maybe we'll conclude now. Um, let's thank Helen again. That was a wonderful talk, and thanks for having a wonderful discussion Q and A. Of course, thank you all so much for being here. If you have any other questions, et cetera, feel free to email me. Um, I assume that you can acquire my email from Jacob's correspondence. Yes, <laughs> but also there's a link to your homepage on uh, the foundation's yes, seminar enough. series website. You can find uh, Helen's email address there. Um, it's wonderful to see all of you. Thank you for spending your time with us. Stay tuned for the announcement of the next talk and that talk will be in two weeks. It's good to see everybody. Thanks.